welcome to the RV Entrepreneur Podcast, the weekly show for nomads, work campers, RVers, and entrepreneurs looking to earn a living or build a business while enjoying the RV lifestyle. This week's host is Joshua Sheehan. Let's settle in and enjoy the RV Entrepreneur Podcast brought to you by RV Life. This episode is sponsored by Wholesale Warranties. Protecting your RV investment means being ready for anything. An extended RV warranty from Wholesale Warranties is the best way to make sure that if an RV failure happens, you can afford to get back to enjoying the RV life as soon as possible. RV warranties are available for motorhomes, fifth wheels, and travel trailers, new and used, across the U.S. Visit WholesaleWarranties.com for a free personalized RV warranty quote today and hit the road with peace of mind tomorrow. This episode is sponsored by RV Flex Repair. Don't let a damaged RV roof keep you from hitting the open road. RV Flex Repair by Ziolo is the perfect solution for RV owners who want to keep their vehicles in top condition. Our easy to use complete RV roofing system can be applied in just one coat and is compatible with other products for added flexibility. Plus, with a lifetime warranty and free shipping, you can have peace of mind knowing your RV roof will last as long as your own vehicle. Visit RVFlexRepair.com today and join the thousands of other satisfied RV owners who have already restored their roofs with RV Flex Repair. Hey there, RV entrepreneurs. Joshua here. I'm excited for this week's episode. We've got an interview kind of coming from a different angle of entrepreneurship than normally we do. Usually, we're talking about people who are using RVs to get out and travel and starting businesses on the road from their RV. Today, we're kind of coming from the manufacturer standpoint. We've got Micah from Brinkley RV coming to just talk through his entrepreneurial journey, how he got into the business, how his story has progressed, and where the stepping stones he took from getting into the RV manufacturing business to where he is today, uh, helping to run Brinkley RV, which is one of the newest. And from what I saw at the Tampa RV Show, one of the best RVs being made out there right now. So, it's a cool glimpse into another side of RV entrepreneurism that we don't usually touch in and we haven't touched on much in the past. It's really cool to hear just this different perspective and a different side of the story. So with that, let's jump into the interview with Micah. Awesome, Micah. Welcome to the RV Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm really excited to talk with you today because over the past you know, 18 months of me being the host of this podcast and in the past of it with all, all the other hosts, I don't know that we've had many people coming from your aspect of RV entrepreneurs. We've, we've had a lot of people who use RVs to go and do things, create businesses and use the RV as travel. But I, what I do know about you is your name and that you have some association with Brinkley RV and previously Grand Design. Other than that, I'm curious to hear your entrepreneurial story and also coming at this from more the manufacturer standpoint of a more traditional entrepreneur route. But I'm, I'm just curious to get to know you. So other than your name, Give me a little story. Who is Micah? And, uh, you know, sitting 11th grade English class, what did you want to be when you grew up? Hey, first of all, Josh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And yeah, I'd love to tell you. So 11th grade, I, uh, I grew up in, uh, in Elkhart, Indiana. So I was born and raised here. Uh, I saw RVs pass me every single day when I was a kid. We camped growing up and I never really thought anything of it. In fact, I didn't even know manufacturing was a big deal in our area. That's how oblivious I was to the whole industry, but I did see them often and I, and we camped it ourselves. So I was around it my whole life. We grew up camping. I got a twin sister who works here at Brinkley um, with me and an older brother, a Josh, who's in the industry as well. Yeah, we camped our whole lives. We started off with a pop-up and then moved into a, a long 31 foot bunkhouse and then went to a motor home. And then we had a couple of motor homes, like when I was in high school and into college and I played college football, so my parents would even come to our games in the motorhome, and we'd tailgate before the games. Mm-hmm. So I always wanted to be a, an athlete, a sports star. I played college football at Grand Valley State University. So I'm competitive, and I knew very little about the RV industry. And as I was getting older into my college career, my brother, my older brother, started selling RVs for Forest River. And I thought, man, I'd love to do what he's doing. He had a house and a nice car. And I thought, man, I'd love to get in that, whatever that is, but it's right in our area. So it seems perfect. So wife and I got married in Maui, Hawaii. 
Nice. Not a lot of RVs out there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we moved back right after marriage and started working in the RV industry. Started at, actually at a company called Open Range at the time. Granny Graber was the the owner and started with us. There was eight of us. You know, I ran into him at my buddy's bachelor party, believe it or not, and he said, "Hey, I'm uh, I'm starting an RV company here in about six months. I'd love for you to be a part of it." He knew me from high school, uh, just playing sports. He watched me and. He started open range and I saw all the ins and outs of starting a company from scratch. Uh, I was 23 years old. So right out of the gates, I was kind of introduced to, you know, how a new company starts, how they survive their challenges, you know, where they have their hiccups and learned a lot from it. I was just a sales trainee. So just like on the ground level, but I was doing like the owner's manuals and all the stuff that you do when you start a company because you're so lean and Everybody needs to wear multiple hats. All right. So I started as a trainee and worked my way up, you know, salesman. And then after three years, I was the national sales manager, which would be like a general manager. And I was in charge of designing and developing the product that was already designed, just maintaining it more than anything, coming up with new floor plans. And I was probably 26 years old at the time and did that for another two years and then was approached by uh, another longtime friend, Ron Finnick who approached me at the Tampa RV show and said, hey, we're starting up an RV manufacturing company. I want you to be a part of it. And he had tried hiring me multiple times throughout my career at Open Range, and I just was happy there. I was not interested in really going to Keystone, which is where he was at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? Tell me a little bit about the company. And he basically went into you know all the different areas in the ways that grand design was going to be different in the marketplace. And it just was like, man, that's everything I want our company to be. So shortly after I joined them, I had a small percentage of ownership and I was, you know, employee number 18, I think, or 21 maybe at, uh, at grand design. So started right on the ground level and worked its way up. They said, we want you to design and develop the mid profile fifth well. So I started a brand called reflection. I'm sure you've heard of it. Mm Mm-hmm had a lot of learning curves along the way. It was I never started a brand from scratch because there's not many people get the opportunity to actually start something from scratch with a new brand. There's so many different things that you, you don't really know you don't know. So I learned a lot through it and the product was doing well. It was well received in the marketplace. But I was always really focused on A, I knew that it had my name attached to it. So I took a lot of pride in making sure that if customers are having issues or, you know, there was new features. I mean, I took it as personal. If they had an issue, I needed to design it better. If they had didn't like an interior color, I didn't do a good job of seeking enough feedback. So actually, let me back up and tell you something that's important. When I was at Open Range, after I became a sales rep, I knew nothing about RVs or how to sell RVs. So mm-hmm. I talked them into me being a uh, 1099 because we didn't have a, a program where you could tow the RVs and I wanted to take them and use them because I wanted to learn everything about them. Right. And I basically said, Hey, I'm, I want to sign a voluntary termination and I want you guys to bring me on as a sole proprietor or 1099 contract work. I'll sell RVs for you exclusively, but I want to buy my own truck and tow them around the country on my own. And they were like, yeah, that's fine. That'd be great. So right away, I started towing them around. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was obsessed with figuring out, A, how to make them better, B, how to use them, how to make them more functional. But I would pull into McDonald's parking lots and uh, I would bring LP with me so I could run the furnace so I could like make sure the heat ducts were, you know, all the heat was being distributed properly. And I would lay in the beds, they had plastic on the beds, and I would lay in them and kind of lay there for a while and be like, man, it's these are kind of uncomfortable. Like, why are we doing that? <laughs> and I started manually overriding the slides just to understand it. And then shortly after that, Randy came up with this idea to put auto leveling. It was actually the first auto level that was made for a fifth wheel. Mm-hmm. because It was exclusive to motorized. Right. And I worked with Lippert on developing the electric automatic leveling 1.0. It's funny because nobody remembers what that was, but there was a turn knob to literally manually level the coach. And uh, I just worked with them on the feedback and gave them insight. And I did some videos on the internet, which is astonishing because there was actually the internet back then. 
But we had like a voiceover thing. And anyways, I did this video thing to help them and give them feedback on what we need to change because Randy was getting ready to put it into his product. And that's kind of what started it. So I was always really intrigued with how to make it better, how to make it better for the customer, how to make it more user friendly, where to put outlets, you know, how to duct your heat, you know, your heating so that it's distributed equally. So that was uh, my experience at Open Range. And the reason that's important is really more than anything, just because I got obsessed with figuring out how to make these things better than what my competition was making them. But more importantly, like how to make it the most functional for the end user. And so that just kind of progressed. And when I went to Grand Design, I it started reflection, like I mentioned earlier, and continued to do that. And the product was doing really well. And then I said, we really need a lightweight travel trailer. And so I developed a product called Imagine. And it was doing really, really well. And then I even, towards the end of my career there, I started a third brand called Transcend, which was our stick and tin. Mm -hmm. And then continued to expand reflection and had a half ton series. I had a travel trailer. I had an XLS. And then I started a one more called Silhouette, which I still don't even know if they've released to this day, but started it was a European, small European travel trailer. It was really cool. I was super excited about it. And I did it during COVID because I wasn't allowed to make any changes on the product because there was it was such a dire need just to get something out. Yeah. Get something out. You know what I mean? Like parts were so few and far between. It was hard enough getting them, let alone changing anything. Mm-hmm. So Randy, my boss there, let me uh, start a new brand. And I think he was doing me more of a favor because he knew I was going to go crazy. So for a year and a half or so, I just worked on this little travel trailer. And that was right before I left, and it took a lot longer than what I expected. But anyways, that's my the story up until starting Brinkley. After a while, we just started seeing, as you grow and get big and you know we were publicly traded, things just started slowly changing and evolving, and just it's part of being publicly traded. Right. And there were some compromises, some things, again, like I was saying, is you know, getting units out the door and using parts that, you know, we had to use because we had to ship units. It just didn't set well with me. I knew there was a ton of opportunity out there to start something. I think the market was just ready for a new manufacturer to start in the industry. And and so Nate Goldenberg, who was my counterpart, who's also co-owner at Brinkley with me, was there at Grand Design. And him and I did the same thing. He had two brands and I had the other three. And he also felt the exact same way. So we partnered up with Ryan Twaits and later we partnered with Ron and Bill and started Brinkley and we had to sit out, you know, we had a non-compete. So we had to sit out for a full year. And during that time, it gave me time to spend time with the family and travel and really enjoy the time off as best I could. But after about six months, I just, I was going stir crazy, not doing anything. So finally, after it ended, we were able to start developing these new products and looking at what we wanted to enter in the marketplace. And we basically created these long lists of here's everything we want to be in as an RV manufacturing company. And how do we protect our people? How do we make it all about the people? And we developed a slogan that said, we're a people first company that just so happens to be building RVs. And we still are. I mean, still to this day, your employees are so important. And the more you can pour into them and really lead them and make sure that you're connected with them, especially as you get big, it's so important. And, and we've already seen it, that, you know, how valuable it is here at Brinkley with just really connecting at a deeper level with your people. And I'm in the plants every single day. My, my office is in the production office, believe it or not, because I want to be that connected with what's going on, what we're building. And I watch social media, like you mentioned, I watch it like a hawk. And we got a great program, a system in place where I get information fed to me I troll it on my own sometimes, but I get it fed to me so that we can stay on top of issues and I can walk right out to the plant and fix it immediately. Yeah, so that's that's where we're at. We're loving it. We are um, really feel like we're delivering product that has great quality and um, our customer service is going to back us up and support us on the back end because we understand how important it is to, that customers feel like they're important and, and we're going to do everything we can to continue that. Yeah, that's a really cool timeline of how you got into it. I'm curious to know your thoughts. Do you think if if you had started out with any other spot instead of starting at open range when it began, if you had started with something that had already been established, 
Do you think the projection would have ended you to where you are now? Or do you think jumping in at that point and seeing all of the startup stuff and the, as you said, mentioned, everyone's wearing every hat because you got to be lean and, and mean. Do you think that that played a role in the trajectory? Or do you think you would have gotten to this place? Eventually, it might just taken a different route. I think it would have been different. I don't know if I would have ultimately got to where I'm at, maybe, but not as quickly as it happened because what we learned there, I always worked for a privately held company. We could make changes on the fly. We were always product oriented, but it's different when, you know, if you work for a Thor or Forest River or any other publicly traded company around here, manufacturer, they have these real systems and they're really, really good at their systems within a big organization, but there's less human interaction when it comes to like the the relationships with people on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot about that at open range and then later on at grand design as well. And that was always something that, you know, like when your people believe in you and they trust you and you can be transparent with them, it's just amazing the things you can accomplish when you have that kind of deep relationship. Talk to me about the name. Where did Brinkley RV come from? (laughs) That's funny you ask. I just explained this to a customer yesterday. It's so funny. I almost wish we would have figured out and talked about how to, how to answer that question because it was really a fluke. We wanted to have a name that when people Googled it, all that showed up was it's this kick-ass RV manufacturing company. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean this or it's not a place over in uh, on the West Coast or it's not a mountain in Colorado. That's all it meant. And so that's hard to come up with, especially a, something that, that's not already taken. Right. But Ron Finnick, one of our my partners, and he called me one day and he said, hey, I, I've been thinking about this. And he's like, and I, and his wife mentioned to him, he said, Lisa mentioned the name Brinkley. He goes, it's the dog on uh, You've Got Mail, the movie. Mm-hmm. He said, it sounds high end. He's like, give it some thought, you know, kind of sounds like he's like, and Ron would always say, you guys do what you want. This is your company. But I just feel like there's something there. So we started creating these different logos with it and asking people, hey, what do you think? Hey, what do you think? You know, and we probably did that for a month. And every time it was interesting, like people would be like, Brinkley, yeah, I like that. And so it just stuck. And that's where it came from. And it, it really doesn't mean anything necessarily other than now, hopefully people are starting to see that when they hear that that term, it's a, a quality RV manufacturing company that's pushing the limits and changing the industry just by building an RV that was quality and based around the needs of the end user. So, Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I think you're spot on with trying to find a name that doesn't mean anything else, right? Like there's a lot of names you could come up with that mean something maybe within the RV space, but they, you're right. They also mean something like a town or a, a geographic feature or something. But when you Google Brinkley, you're not coming up with a whole lot of anything other than Brinkley RV, which is really cool. And I think that makes you know, maybe it's a little harder for search engine optimization or whatever, but those are obstacles that are easily jumped over. And the end goal is you're making a brand out of nothing. Like you're making the name Brinkley RV mean something without any preconceived notions from the consumer or the market. And I think there's a lot of power in there, also a lot of responsibility, but a lot of power in being able to direct that narrative and be able to say, this is what a Brinkley RV is and this is what we stand for. That's really cool. Right on. Tell me a little bit about the roadblocks or the hurdles of starting a new company. What are some of the things that you know people don't think about when you're starting an RV manufacturer? What kind of things do you guys have to deal with in order to get that even to the point of putting product on the line? Oh, well, I don't know if you know our story, how we started. We built a unit right after our agreements were over with. We started as fast as we could, started to build a unit and Bay built it. And we had two employees and later hired a third. And that's it. And then we had a couple sales guys who came over and literally, we couldn't even pay them. We were, they just wanted to come over and join the, join the team. And they were like, hey, we'll work for free, which is unbelievable. But they believed in us. And we started Bay building this vision of what I had for this product segment. And it took us about two and a half months and we all did it. I mean, the sales guys, myself, I mean, we were wearing tool belts every single day. We built the first unit and then it was right before we had to take this road trip to the West Coast for um, my other partner, Ryan Twaits. He was getting married out in Malibu, California. And we said, hey, let's make a trip out of this and let's stop at campgrounds and get people's feedback. Let's touch as many people as we can so we can make sure we're on the right track with this thing. So we did that. I took my wife 
Naomi and my two boys, Jacob and Jaden, and we stopped it. Man, I, I want to say it was 11 or 14 different campgrounds. And we just asked people. To, I mean, I had them come over at all times of night. Come on over. Check this thing out. What do you guys think? <laughs> Everyone's like, I've never heard of it. What is it? And I said, it's a new company. We're just starting. And I had them, showed them a lot of the features and had them come through. And oh, it was great. The feedback was awesome. You know, you could tell we were on the right track. So it was a really, really valuable part of our story because nobody in this industry does that, right? Mm -hmm. Very few people actually camp, number one, but to start a company off and have something built that much in advance and then, you know, before we even started production. So we ended up coming back, building another one just because we had a big show that like where dealers were going to come uh -huh. and we built another one two, three months later. And then we built a third one to put on the, the Bosch testing track so that we could find out, you know, structurally if there was any issues or what things we could work on. So it was about six months prior to us even starting the manufacturing the line, we had a, our first proto built. But to answer your original question, some of the challenges are as you go up in production rates, there's a new person that now this guy was doing these two things or these three things. Now he does two of those things and another guy does one. And then you go up again and that first guy only does one of those things and the second guy does, you know what I mean? It's right. So it's constant training. You got to tell these people on the production line, the why. The why is so important. And if, when they understand that and they embrace it and they like support it and they receive it so well that they can execute because they believe in you and they understand. If they just think they're building these things and they're shooting out of here at the end of the day and we don't have any passion or like we're not trying to really change the way that RVs are built, then they wouldn't be the same. So one of the biggest challenges is just making sure you stay in front of them and you tell them the why all the time. Here's the first floor plan and we're going to build it this many in a row and we're going to have this few options so that you guys can just build the same thing and we can focus on quality and training our people. And then, you know, you go up, you know, you go from one to two and then, you know, at two, we had to hire more people. And then, but what we decided to do was we have this new process where our group leaders, so we have a 12 different group leaders and each one of them is over shelling or final finish or floors or roof, you know, like whatever the different department is typically in this industry, those guys wear tool belts and they're basically responsible for that department and making sure that the unit goes into the next station finished. Well, we decided to change that process and we decided to have them not wear tool belts and all they're gonna do is work hand in hand with the other group leaders and we actually call them PCLs, product control leaders. And what they do is they're training all day long and they're walking their unit to make sure that their guys are all trained, they're doing the right things, everyone's constantly doing it the right way. So. We thought it was going to require that many more employees on the line, but it hasn't because it's so much different than what we've always done. But our um, director of operations, Mike Bontrager, he's the one that came up with the idea. And we started talking to guys about it and they said, you know what? That's a great idea. We think this is going to work. So it's really changed kind of the whole process and how we've, you know, like each group leader and how they're responsible for this group and training them because we keep going up in numbers. Mm -hmm. There's been a high demand for the product. We've had a lot of retail success early on and we got customers waiting for units. So we want to make sure that we can get them built, but with quality. And when you're constantly increasing your rates and adding more people, it's just that much more training. So it's been exciting. It's got its challenges, but we just love it. I mean, we breathe it. We, you know, we work all the time, 24 seven, which is, it can be unhealthy at times, but us five owners, we all just are really passionate about this industry and we love it and we're excited to do what we're doing. So it sounds like all of you came together because you wanted to make sure that you're providing a quality product and there are certain things that you guys wanted to meet that you couldn't be meeting in your previous roles. Talk to me about how did that work taking these things that you guys are, all of you, it sounds like are very forward thinking, very entrepreneurial, like I got this grand idea. Now, how do we actually make it happen and implement it? How did it happen that you were taking those ideas and getting them on paper? Like, were there certain things that you wanted to do that based off of resources of that product does not exist, you couldn't accomplish one thing or other? Absolutely. 
the four of us, Ron, Bill, myself, and Nate, all worked at Grand Design. Ron and Bill were actually co-founders. So the four of us have worked together in the past. And Ryan was into the industry, and then he got on the transportation side, and then on the supplier side, and then now he's back in the industry. But he's always been a part of the RV industry, just in different areas of it. And really, we said, hey, we're going to write down the three of us, myself, Ryan, and Nate are the managing partners. And we're here every single day. Ron and Bill, they, they live in Florida and, and Michigan, so they're, ne- they're not here very often, maybe once a month or once every other month. But mm-hmm. the three of us decided we're going to write down and say, here's everything that we know that we want to do and because what we've done from the past. But here's things that we've not done and we want to make them better. And we went item by item. I mean, one thing was is we wanted to have a test track where every unit kind of came off the line and it went on this little test track to make sure that shakedown and we had backer in the right spot. So we started laying out and we go, man, the logistics of this are just too complicated. It's just not very efficient. So we invested in this company in Ohio. It's called the Cleveland Vibrators, believe it or not. And it's a vibrating machine that allows you to put this RV on top of this machine. And it basically is the equivalent of driving 500 miles down the road. But all the shakedown and everything in the unit, it all comes down. Then we clean it out. Actually, we, we pop the underbelly. There's a hatch in the underbelly. We make sure there's nothing in the underbelly. And our units have like virtually no sawdust in them, which is a huge problem in the industry. So mm-hmm. that was something we've always tried to capture in the past, but we never had a good system. And we invested in it. We built it right into our pre-delivery inspection line, which is at the end of our production line. And it's the first station that it goes on. And we have videos of it. It's really cool. I'll have to send you one sometime. But it works phenomenal. So that that's one idea that we had that said, hey, no one's ever done this. The other one is everybody starts in the industry at 5 or 5.30 because in the, in the summertime, it's so hot that they try to beat the heat. So they try to get out of there and start early so that they get out of there before it gets really, really hot. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is guys are drinking Red Bulls and they're all, they just to stay awake because the quality of life, they get such little sleep. So we decided to push our start time back to six o'clock and we decided to air condition our plants, which has never been done in this industry. So in those hot summer days, we can make sure that our, our people aren't just sweating their butts off inside the plants, that we've got a comfortable environment for them, which really helps with attracting good quality employees as well. So there's just things like that, that we just said, man, we've done all this in the past. We know this is what we want, but how can we tackle this issue? And how can we tackle this issue? And then another one that we experienced in the past is we would start in these small little plants and then grow and then change to a new plant that was bigger and then grow and then change to another plant because we kept running out of room. We decided to build state-of-the-art facilities right out of the gates so that they never have to move. We can get into our rhythm. The guys, we show how much we care about them because we want to have nice facilities that are clean and it was well thought out. And so the whole building is, every area is just super hyper focused on how do we make it more efficient for them? How can we keep things off the floor? And so our mezzanine goes all the way around the perimeter so that we can make sure that we are super efficient with our builds, but also so that it's set up for the best interests of our employees. And it's been fun. Our facility is incredible. We've been really blessed and we decided to do it up front regardless of the cost. And we're going to build eight of them in a row four and four on our facility with a lamination facility in the back. So the other one was like traffic study. We did a Purdue engineering came in. In our past, we would kind of fit plants in. When we'd build a new plant, we'd fit it in on the complex. Mm-hmm. There was always these pinch points for delivery trucks that they'd get log jammed and literally couldn't even move because it was pinched off. There was not enough room. So we had them come and we spent three full days on it. Just a traffic study on how we want this to be the most efficient so that the drivers can come and then they can loop around and then exit. And our whole facility was laid out that way from the start. So it was things like that, that we said, Hey, let's just figure out how to make it. Number one, make it uncomfortable for our employees. Number two, how do we make, make sure we build extremely high quality product. And then number three, obviously is how do we take care of our customer the best on the back end so we can get them back on the road and get them camping. Yeah, that's super cool that you guys thought about all that stuff ahead of time and, and just built it in from the start. Yep. Talk to me a little bit about why choose to start in that location, right? Like everybody's centered there. 
which also means that I can imagine there's oftentimes shortage on employees and, and you know physical hands to do work in that location. What is the benefit trade-off of, of sticking you know in the RV capital versus going to somewhere totally new and, and dealing with all the issues that might that might arrive from being further away from where other suppliers are? Yeah, actually, it's a good question. And when we were at Grand Design, we were quite a bit north. And that's a pretty long haul for the Amish, you know, um, however they're transported, whether that some of them rode their bikes or got rides from people. But we knew we needed to draw from Topeka and we knew the surrounding Goshen, Topeka, Ligonier. And those are the main areas where we felt like there was the highest quality of workers, Mm -hmm. whether it be that they work at a different plant. But we used to hear it all the time at Grand Design that we couldn't get some people just because of it was too far. I mean, it, if they weren't getting a ride, it was, you know, two hours extra every day because they rode their bike or however they got there. Mm-hmm. The Amish are the majority of our production force. Okay. I would say 70, 80% of them. And the surrounding counties where we're at is where we felt like was the best for them. So it's a win-win for us. We're near all the suppliers, so it's easy to get parts. But at the same time, we're near the where the work majority of the workforce is, is living at. Yeah, makes sense. So what's got you excited for the future? What are you looking forward to with this new, you almost have a blank canvas and you guys have started drawing. And based off of what I've seen, I saw the units at the Tampa RV show. And it's just the, the attention to detail and the little things that make it stand above a lot of the other offerings on the market right now. But now that you've got some of that going, where are you looking forward to? What's that sparkling light on the horizon for you that you're really excited about? We take it, you know, just step by step and uh, we're not trying to rush into anything. But I think for all of us, I think the most exciting thing is, is continuing to build a product that's constantly evolving so that we're constantly listening to what the customer is asking for. But expanding our floor plan lineup uh, within the two brands that we have. So we have Model Z, which is our midsize luxury fifth wheel. And then we have our luxury toy hauler fifth wheel, Model G. and just expanding those so that we can capture a, a you know a broader range in the market, but at the same time, then go moving into more of a half ton towable version of the Model Z, and a more I guess affordable version. So almost not a step down, but more maybe just less contented version of the Model G, and then a higher end yet Model G with probably some you know full body paint and that kind of thing, and then getting the lightweight travel trailers will be next. And we're going to call that product Model I. And then eventually we'll get into our high-end luxury fifth wheel, which would be called Model R. It's going to be R-I-G-Z. So that it'll be like rigs. Nice. And uh, yeah, so that's, we're just going to have those four brands. I mean, that's the plan as of right now. And it's exciting just because I think if we continue to build good quality, we can touch a lot of people's lives and change a lot of people's perspective on how RVs are built and what the industry is all about. So that's exciting for us. Yeah, you guys are definitely poised in one of the most influential spots of being able to come in with new product and show what can be done, both at innovation, but also customer service and quality. It sounds like all the feedback that I've been getting that you guys are are making strides to hit all those marks. So it's really cool. Mike, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to just give us a rundown of your, your past experience. Like I said, I didn't have any prior knowledge of your background, but it's really cool to hear how different dominoes got tipped over and they led you to, you know, starting one of the the newest and best RV brands that is coming out. And it's really cool to hear how much quality and community, both for your your workers and for your customers, plays into what you guys are building over there. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to to jump on and, and walk me through all that. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and appreciate it. Is there any place other than BrinkleyRV.com that folks should go to check out more stuff? Is there certain social medias that you guys are trying to promote? We have several different social media pages, all the different platforms. I know we have Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. and But I think our prior Facebook is the one that's most active. There's Brinkley RV Group. And there's some other ones, Brinkley RV Fans, which actually we don't. It's not us. It's a actually a retail customer. And there's the owners groups. So each brand has its own Model Z owners group, Model G owners group. And then we have just Brinkley RV owners. We want to be active on there so that we can make sure that we're seeing what customers are dealing with, but also like what they appreciate, what they like, 
if they were surprised or if they're even disappointed, we want to make sure that we address it. So I would say Facebook's probably the number one thing we want people to, to get on. Awesome. Cool. I'll make sure to put links to all that stuff into the show notes. Micah, thank you. All right. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Micah. Brinkley is doing some really cool things in the RV industry. And as you heard, they're super focused on community, both with their people and with their customers. And then through that, providing the best for your community means providing the best working conditions and also the highest quality product that you can. And from all the feedback that I've heard, they are succeeding. So it's really cool to hear the position that they're in to take some of these things that they have wanted to improve upon or make better in the industry. And now with this new manufacturer, they're able to use that and leverage things to make RVs a little bit better, kind of address some of the concerns that consumers have had for a long time. And uh, it looks like Brinkley is poised to be one of the leaders in kind of ushering the new wave of RV manufacturing into existence. So I hope you enjoyed that. You got some little tidbits and some backstory about Brinkley RV and entrepreneurism from the manufacturing standpoint. I think it's a really cool story. And and I really enjoy following along with this stuff and seeing where Brinkley and all the rest of the manufacturers go in the future in creating such a crucial aspect of RV entrepreneurism. You know, We wouldn't be RV entrepreneurs if there weren't RVs. So it's really cool to see the manufacturing standpoint as well. If you're interested in talking more about RV entrepreneurism, make sure you jump over to the Facebook group, therventrepreneur.com slash Facebook group will take you there. And with that, happy trails. Happy trails.